I'll be walking through how we do this annotation stuff on MoveBank. And I wanted to first say, we have these really awesome brochures we had made up for a conference uh, last fall, and they're still basically like up to date. So if you have anybody you would like to share one of these with, there, there are some out on the table right out here. And also this cute little brochure for the new update, updated app. So if you need something to bring home for a special someone, um, <laughs> feel free to take them. Uh, and so, first off, if you forget any of what we talk about, um, you can go to MoveBank and this MV data section, this is like all the, this will walk you through, you can also access it through the manual help user manual we'll get you here to, um, but this will walk you through basically what we're gonna cover. So first off, here's a list of, one of the things we're gonna talk about is you wanna think, and we've been talking about all day is, Think about what data you have, think about your question, and think about the resolution of both your data and your environmental covariates that you want to work with. So here you get a summary of like product level um, resolutions and spatial and temporal range. And so this is kind of a good reference to start with. Um, and then the next page of this is um, this gives you the instructions of what we're going to walk through. So it's all right here, if you forget. Okay, so we go to MoveBank and we go to this studies page. And here um, I have this showing a list of studies where I can see the data. Now, if we're annotating environmental information, we have to be able to download it. So. If you've got your own data, you go to Studies where I'm a data manager. This user, I didn't, I'm not a data manager on anything, but I can say Studies where I can download any data. So for any of these, I can annotate environmental information. And so this doesn't matter too much. We'll do, how about we do the kinkajous? Ooh. And then, okay, so we see this MV data, click on that. And then we can click Start Annotation Request. OK, and so you'll see on your outline that we talk about the back end. You can cross that out because as of Friday, this looks different than it did before. And you can annotate what used to be you had to do a little bit of a rigmarole to get to. Now you can just do it right on MoveBank. So that makes what we're going to go through here today a little bit easier. But so the first thing we'll walk through is just, I want to annotate tracking data from the study. And so here you'll see a list of animals, or if you have data that might not yet be linked to animals, you could choose tags if you wanted, um, usually animals, and select those. If you wanted to annotate outliers, you could, but by default, you won't. Um, if you had like Argos and GPS or radio tracking and GPS data, you could choose to select to use only one of those sensors or all of them. And then you hit continue. And so here you have, here's where you can browse all of the environmental variables that you can annotate. And so it's probably like five or 600 variables and dozens of products. So if you're new to it, it might be a little bit, seem a little bit crazy, but so here, this basic list is pretty reasonable. You can look through that and then that table I just showed you and kind of get a grasp of what, what's there. Um, but the other thing, the other way you can browse these is to just search by type of information you're interested in. So, I don't know, topography. So if you're interested in bathymetry, you could look here and see actually only one of the um, DEMs includes bathymetry, so there's there's one you want to go with. Um, elevation here, so it'll compile all of those products relevant to whatever type of information you're looking for. Um, weather, earth surface and vegetation. Um, so somebody, I didn't plan what we will put through this, so uh, anybody have anything they are interested in? Weather, okay, we'll do weather. Clouds. 
Any more detail of what kind of weather you're interested in? Cloud cover. Okay, so it's a cloud cover. So, um, here, so once we pick the type, now it's filtering us down to choose what resolution, what resolutions are available. Um, so this where it says North America only, that's that North American regional reanalysis weather model. And so, what? Yeah, I put it directly in the name because otherwise people would accidentally annotate it and get sad that they got all NAs. So as you click down, once you get to the level of a product, you'll see a little info button. And here is where you can see more information about the product and it links you to, through to lots of more information about it. And then once you get to the actual variables that you can choose from, there's little info buttons by those and that's where you get also a bunch more information. You can see what the resolution at the level of a variable is, link you to other information, see what your units are gonna be, and all of this same information will also be included with your output when you get your results. So when you actually, once you've chosen what you're gonna annotate, you'll get documentation of all this along with your results. Yeah, and then it also will help you, when we talk about preparing available data, it's good to have in mind what's the sort, what's the resolution of the information we want to annotate to it. Just click on that I button for two seconds there. Is it on? I don't think it's on. Um, so, uh, like, so this one is 0.3 degrees spatial granularity, right? Which is, given that a King Kiju home range is about 50 hectares. Um, that's 32 kilometers. No, that's 75 kilometers. Right. So, so there's not going to be any, any spatial difference between any of the kinkajus. The grid is so big that at the scale that these kinkajus move, um, they're all experiencing the same cloud cover. But it will get annotated in time. But it will get annotated in time. So it, could be, it still could be quite useful. But you just want to think about, it's, it, it's really important to think about the spatial granularity and the, temperature, the temporal granularity when you're thinking about your questions and the scale your animals move. Because some of these, most of these are really big scale because of the, because uh, they're global. So when we're looking at this and we're, we're talking about cloud cover, like in particular for this one, um, you're saying all the kinkajus may be seeing the same cloud cover, but if we're just wanting to look at them in general and their activity patterns when clouds, when there's a lot of clouds versus when there's little clouds, with that, that could be something that could be done with this? Yeah. Okay. So but again, always think about the meaning of that data. So read about the data. So this is not whether there was an actual cloud in the sky or not. This is kind of the cloudiness tendency over a three hour period mm -hmm. over that 30 kilometers. So this is more or less will give you a kind of a weekly, was there a big storm that day or not? And in the tropics, it will always be cloudy. So it will give you kind of a seasonal indication. So not every variable just because cloud sounds cool is giving you what you actually want to know. So I always recommend read about the variable, get a sense of what it actually means, mm -hmm. and then decide if that's what you want to use or it's not suitable for what you're trying to figure out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is why it's nice. You might just come in here and just like browse around in this for a while and just to get ideas. Um, another thing, like if we wanted to look at Sometimes you get can get different resolutions from different products. So here, like from this should be here you can get down to a kilometer from Modus Land, which is a totally different type of data set from the weather reanalyses. This is based on satellite imagery. But so there you might try them both and see how different it is. And that might help you under like that'll help you understand the data better too and make sure you don't overinterpret it. Um, so anyway, you can, I can answer specific questions about any of these products as you like look through them, so just feel free to ask. Um, let's say daytime and nighttime surface temperature. So in any case, you go ahead and you pick explore, pick which variables you'd like. 
Um, I would recommend don't do a million at once, do a couple at once, um, because we're pulling files from all these different websites, and if it could take sometimes tens of thousands of files, depending on what kind of thing you have requested to meet a request. And so if one of those files we're expecting doesn't show up, it can hang up the whole request. So more smaller requests is better. So don't feel, don't feel bad about submitting lots of small requests, it's fine. Then you hit continue. Can, can you do uh, NDVI? We're not, we won't get the results instantaneously, but we might actually get them by but I think this is a good one to talk about the different mm -hmm. temporal options. Yeah, that's true. Okay, let's get back where we are. Question. So you say it may, we're not going to get back fast, or you have to pull from these databases. Who is this? Some the, the computer doing this, or somebody? Uh, somebody's filling these requests and going in and finding these this data and adding it to the computer. The computer does it, but it just computers. takes a while. Yeah. Yeah. So it can take. I'm just like, like, who does little, this? Little Germans that we send around. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it takes a while. <laughs> Be like, who does that? Because that's a that's a heck of a job. <laughs> the car <feels> super <laughs> Yeah. So we have like a cache. This is the other reason it's hard to say how long it will take to get your results. So we we store some large amount of data, but like there's is. We're not going to try and copy over all these data sets. So we, we kind of keep a cache of frequently used files. And once that gets full, we start to ditch out the files that have been used the least recently and then fill it in with new files. And so like the DEMs, often those just kind of stay in the cache because they're requested a lot. So files that get requested a lot might just hang out in the cache and then you're, it might come through really quickly. Yeah. So where are we at? No, we want vegetation indices. So here we can see we have lots of different resolutions, and I need to fix something that shouldn't be showing up like that. So I need to do that on the train ride home. So let's say, uh, anybody have a favorite resolution? I was going to say, just talk about the trade off of four day versus 16 day. And 200, like, why wouldn't I get the most the, highest resolution stuff all the time? Yeah, so for these uh, satellite imagery based um, data sets, the main thing is that. It's camera up in the sky, and so depending on, you can get images at nighttime, but mostly it's clouds that are an issue. Um, and so if you have lots of cloud cover, then at the higher resolutions, you're just gonna have a lot of, miss, you'll have more missing data because they just couldn't get a picture. But it also depends, if you're in a desert area, there's a lot less cloud cover, and so maybe that's less of an issue. So. Um, yeah, so again, you could try to res try a higher resolution and a lower resolution. These uh, 0 0.05 degree grids are for um, usually used as input and for like climate models. And I think, so we just upgraded all of the MODIS to their version six products because they deleted the version five ones and forced us to do it. It was good because there's a bunch of improvements. And I think with some of these, they might have done some gap filling, which they hadn't done in version five. So at the um, at the 0 0.05 degree resolution, you might be able, might be gap free. I haven't experimented with it yet. The thing with the satellite, you can, there's a camera, the camera has some resolution. So that's the highest resolution that you can get. But most of the pixels will be obstructed. There's a lot of things between the satellite and the ground. There's clouds, there's air pollution, there's all kinds of stuff. So often they, they, what's called mosaic. So within a snapshot of the satellite, they, they find all the pixels within some larger resolution that makes sense and take the average value and assign that to like a larger pixel. So all the, the larger resolutions are basically mosaics in, in space. And then they also give you always, there's a quality control variable, like cloud tells you if what you see is a real value or some reason you need to delete it. People rarely do it, but you should always download the quality control variable with your variable and then do some filtering if the quality control tells you to ignore it, ignore it. But then there's mosaics in time. So the satellite has some return time. Some, so MODIS comes back to the same point, only one, only I think every 16 days or once a week. I think once a week, more or less. So then every 16 days, they have twice. So if the first attempt there was clouds, the second attempt wasn't clouds, they'll take the second one. And they can do the same mosaic for a month, which includes between three and four flybys. So 
They aggregate those different <laughs> values, and plus what you see here, none of it is a direct picture. This is vegetation index, so there is a picture, just wavelengths. You can get it from us, like the actual value at the different wavelengths, but you wouldn't know what to do with it. And these are all kind of model-based things that extract the water column, remove the clouds, normalize for time of day, view angle, put everything together in the same units and give you something processed at some larger resolution of the original pixel, mosaic in time over repeat, repeat visit. Yeah, so you can always check these links. We'll give you like a ton of detail about how the data are processed. And then I tried to add information in the description of the variables about where I could find it, about how they how they took right the, what they did with available imagery to get one one estimate for over whatever resolution they're looking at. So some of that information will be here. Can you talk about EVI versus NDVI? Like, why would you want to use one or the other? I think EVI is better at like high, very productive. So both EVI and NDVI. Give it, go take it works now. So both EVI and NDVI are some parameterized indices that take some ratios. So it, the, they measure at five different wavelengths, the visible blue, red, green, and then two infrareds, one near and one far. And they do some ratios of the different colors and from that, you can tell apart what is soil, what is plants, what's a lot of plants, what less plants. So plants are mostly green. So basically based on that. But if you look green in the evening or where there's clouds, when the green is in the shade versus the green is in the light, it looks different color. So all these indices are supposed to normalize out those influences of illumination and stuff and really get only at the vegetation. They, they each have their limitations. So NDVI tend to saturate at high values. So tropical forests always get very high NDVI, and even if they grow more, they stay the same high NDVI, whereas EVI is more sensitive at the high vegetation ranges. So if you want to focus on tropic vegetation, EVI tends to be better there's other differences between EVI and NDVI. Both of them are, the, are parameterized per vegetation type. So calculate NDVI of conifers will not be the same function as NDVI of grassland. So they need some land use characteristics, which often can be wrong. And again, these are not, these, these are process observation, understand they come with an error. So, I recommend always do a background, look around. If the animal that you're looking at is exactly at that place where NDVI value are, does, don't make sense, that can happen. So just generally when you use data, check it out first. Don't just accept it for what it is, shove it in and assume that it makes sense. Mostly it will make sense, but. Can you talk about uh, aqua versus so MODIS is not a satellite. MODIS is a sensor. It's this thermometer, mid something, yeah, forgot the acronym. That sensor, they build two of them. One on, there is one on the Aqua satellite, one on the Terra satellite. They are both very, very old satellite. One of them is older and really degrading. So the blue wavelength, for example, is not working anymore. So they need to reinvent those indices to make up the fact that the blue is basically barely working and with stuff like that. So there is a new fancier sensor with more wavelengths sitting on the Swami NPP, which we link to now. Huh, it's not here. Huh? Well, because right now, if you go to the MODIS or the, the, da it's not, not the data distribution site, they um, only have, they've, so once the VIRS data products are available, they'll go back to 2012. They have been collecting the data, but right now all they're making available at the level that we access it is the reflectance data. So we've tested it, it's in the system, it works, but no, people aren't gonna annotate they band do. three. So once, once the NDVI products, once the ve vegetation index products for VIRS are available, it's gonna look a lot like this, and then what you'll be able to do is get a, a modus aqua, a modus terra, and a veers estimate using the same processing, but with different pictures, 
as input. So in, in theory, the aqua and the terra should give the same information. They each have, they both fly all over Earth, each has a different visit time. So some, if you're in areas which are continuously obstructed by clouds, you should try both, maybe you get lucky in one. They have different errors, they have different degradation and so forth, so it is not always they tell you the same thing. In theory, it should be the same, there shouldn't be difference. What you should know that the Terra products use an algorithm that's optimized for terrestrial vegetation, and then they run it on aqua, though they didn't focus on that. The aqua products were optimized for, so the scientists that work on the aqua data really care about uh, ocean productivity and chlorophyll density, so they tweak the algorithms like that, but then the same ocean productivity algorithm that was optimized on aqua data, they just run it on the data stream from, from Terra. So the may, usually if you use land data from aqua, there may be a larger error, it's a little bit less tested, but I would try both. Okay, so let's let's just pick, let's like do NDVI from both of these. And if we get the results back by tomorrow, we can see how different it is. But yeah, so that's a nice, you can get basically two estimates doing the same thing, and then it'll give you an idea of how much you should be interpreting the data. Cause so, so for example, here is a habit. If you use, if you go for NDVI, also click the pixel reliability and where, so the pixel reliability is an index if the data is bad or good. And if the data is bad, just filter that point out. Don't trust it. It will still give you an NDVI. Maybe some, on some extreme values, they give a blank in the NDVI. So there's a none on NDVI. But there's some kind of intermediate value where they're highly unreliable and yet an NDVI value will be calculated, which I urge you to filter out. Okay, so I'll, I don't want to recommend doing more than these, so I'll stop clicking variables. Then, okay, so the next thing you do is you pick what interpolation method you want to use, and we've got a whole page. Uh, da -da here where we talk about them, and I think it's worth reading those, and in particular how they treat missing data values. So for some products, they're model output, so they don't have missing data values really, so like the DEMs and the weather analyses, um, but for like the MODIS, there will be missing data values, and each method treats them differently, so that's worth um, reading. Basically, the by linear interpolation, uh, will I think if any of the adjacent values are missing, it will just throw you an NA. But if you use inv inverse distance weighted, it will work with whatever valid values it gets in those adjacent pixels. And so, so normally, you, the, the, the recommended one is you should probably just stick with it. So, general recommendation for model-based data use the bilinear. So everything that comes out of a reanalysis that you don't expect missing values and the data was squarely gridded, use bilinear. For direct observation satellite data, use the inverse weighted distance. And for categorical data, such as the pixel reliability, you have to use nearest neighbor because you can't interpolate across categories. It makes no sense. So it doesn't even let you choose. Oh, and then, so since you're downloading somebody else's data, you'll have to agree to the license term. And I think you usually only have to do that once. And then here you see a summary of what you've done. You can go back and change if you need to. And then you sent, you put in an email address that you want to get a notification for once it's ready. And then you can make up a name for the request that is makes sense to you. And then you just click to send the annotation request. 
And then you wait so it won't like come back while your browser is sitting there. You'll get an email when it's ready because like I said, we don't know how long it will take. Um, so that's what, yeah. env data will interpolate it in time to your observation. Now the question is why, what do you want to know? So it's possible that if you're looking at swift movement in a, in a swarm, that the wind speed over four hours was one value and you don't care about it. So it doesn't we average, it interpolates. We, it we will interpolate it to the timestamp of your observation, always. Now, if you need to think of what is the variation of the movement, how, co how high resolution temporal you need the information whereas, versus what it, if MODIS is only giving you data every 16 days and all you have is three days of data, then that variable is not suitable for what you want. If you have daily movements and the data is every four hours, great. You have everything that you need. Yeah, so MoveBank will interpolate anything to anything as long as there's valid data from both your tracking data and the environmental data. But yeah, you have to think about what sense it makes. What MoveBank will not do is extrapolate. So if the data ended just before your last point, even though it's really close, it will come out as none. And it also, like, I mean, one thing you're getting at is like, I would like to see like cumulative rainfall like Gil talked about, and it, so so we don't at this point have a tool that's going to like aggregate or do other calculations from the data products that we're annotating. But but you you, you mentioned averaging, right? And in a, in essence, like Modis is the average, and then MoveBank is interpolating that average, right? So Modis is sort of giving you sort of an average over 16 days, and then MoveBank is is interpolating the average. Yes, that's 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 the next thing I'm gonna. Which brings us say. to our next lesson. Thank you. <laughs> Very nice transition. Um, so yeah, so as we saw at the beginning here, we can make some other choices here. And so what we're gonna talk about today is this. I would like to annotate generic time location records, and then tomorrow we'll talk about the gridded areas. Um, so. Here's what you used to have to like use this funky other interface to do, and now we just summarize what you need to do. And this is what we've been talking about earlier. Um, John talked about how he prepared the uh, available locations to upload to MoveBank. This is exactly what I did to do that. So um, this describes what what your file should look like. So it needs to have a timestamp. It needs to be in a given format. We're going to calculate it based on it being in UTC time, uh, location dash lat, location or hyphen long. So that's different um, than R will deal with. R will turn them into periods. So just a little thing you might have to change in your header. Um, and then the height above mean sea level, that's needed if you're working with the weather reanalyses and you want to interpolate um, in altitude, vertically. And so this kind of describes what you need to do. If you hit this little button, th this, you'll download a tiny little CSV file that just shows you, so you can be sure. Download it, show it. Do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna look at some sample ideas here in a second anyway, but. Um, That's it. It has to be exactly like that, right? So, so you, like, you need you need to add those dot zero zero zero. Those give me such a 
pain sometimes. And then yeah. you have to add the, the height above sea level. And so you see she's got that as the last one. That has no, to be No, you a don't need to have column. it. No. You could just delete this. Oh, you don't need the column? You don't Heading? need it anymore. Oh, nice. Never mind. Yeah, so, yeah, and I'll talk about that. Um, but so this is just, you could just start with this if you wanted. Um, yeah, and so what I wanted to go through was a couple of examples. Can, can you quickly comment, is it okay to have additional is, columns? It is. <laughs> it is because it didn't used to be. This Where is why started? I'm doing this part. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what? Okay, there that's one. Okay, so yeah, what I want, so here's like a really simple, let's just look at some sample files first. Can you imagine we did this workshop last year without Sarah? I don't know how we They did had it. a lot of problems with them. <laughs> So I'm sorry, there's a few people who have like pigeons that they want to know where they are every zillionth of a second, and that's why all of us have to deal with milliseconds. So we can blame it on the pigeons? We blame it on the pigeons? There's a lot of pigeons so yeah, that right. I see that actually have the data at that right. resolution, blame but there'll the be pigeons. more in the future, I think. I have a question, I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but for the altitude, or the height above sea level measurement, if you're using uh, like GPS collars that have a measurement of well, it's hard. So different GPS, different providers are going to use different datums for that elevation. So some of them are using height above an ellipsoid, and some of them are using a height above mean sea level. And so, uh, like with the ones we have data feeds, we like sort that out. But sometimes people have to contact. Usually, it's not in their documentation, so you need to ask them. Uh, any more to add to that? No, so the weather reanalysis they give, they don't even give elevation. They give data on pressure levels, and we do the conversion from you from pressure levels to height above sea level, not height above ground. So you, for all the weather data interpolation, you need to give it height above sea level. If your GPS spits out height above ellipsoid. So yes, you need some conversion from ellipsoid to above sea level. They can need what, like the geopotential height. This how you geopotential height is how you calculate it. But but I guess I just but I mean, to is, repeat her question. Another, there's another variable you need to do the conversion. But the users don't need to know that. You do it for them. No, but well, if but if their data are in height above ellipsoid and they need to provide it in height above mean sea level. And MoveBank, if it's your tracking data, MoveBank will do the, deal with it for okay. you. Just you have to make sure you import it using the right one. And for your available data, you're responsible for getting into the height above mean sea level. Yes. So when you make up data, make it up in height above sea level. And for tracking, make sure that you use the MoveBank function to translate it from ellipsoid to above sea level. For the purposes of annotation from model reanalysis, you need to know how to hide above sea level. If you ever go to the model reanalysis product, you will find the data on pressure level and will be a variable for per pressure level that gives you the geopotential height, which is that height above sea level of that pressure level. You need to kind of go around. You need to guess what pressure level you need, find out what elevation it was at that time, and then find the one above, the one below, and figure out how to interpolate to where you need. So for marine organisms? Uh, so we don't have reanalysis that have, the only marine reanalysis that we have, we have two marine reanalysis, the ocean currents and the ocean productivity, and they're both, they're, they're both said that basically depth integrated, they are, they are surface, so it's their 2D data. So we, we don't have 3D ocean currents that you need to care about depth. We don't have the 3D ocean temperature products. All, we, also, we only have the satellite product to see surface temperature. So in that sense, you can store the depth in movement, but there's not many useful things with annotation that I can utilize the depth for. So for preparing availability data files, um, yeah, so you can download this super simple example. And like I said, you can now, that's this one is optional, so you can just get rid of that column if you want. And then the other thing that's new, so here's an example somebody sent me as just a little clip of data she wanted to submit, and she asked if this would work. And 
So an example here, the only thing I noticed that was kind of wrong with this is that she has height above MSI, which won't matter because I know she wants to annotate NDVI. She doesn't want to look at the weather, but if she wanted to do, if she did want to annotate at height, MoveBank would not know what this is. It would just ignore it. So, so just be careful. Um, the fact that you have study first, does it? MoveBank look for the names of the... So what it's doing now, yeah, before you could only annotate those three columns, which is really irritating if you wanted to do like what you guys were looking today, where you already have some stuff relevant to each of those records that you want to keep with your annotated data. So now MoveBank will just ignore any other columns. But what that means is that if it'll require that you have these three. So it won't let you, if you have one of these spelled wrong, it will just give you an error so that you correct it. This one, it would not know that that was in there since it's spelled wrong. But yeah, so in this case, she's uh, wanted to look at some different study sites, and so she can put her study site name uh, as another column or whatever else, and that's why I was able to input those availability points just as they were. Now, I did notice the files got really big if you have like a lot of extra columns, and that can cause an, if you're over like 150 megabytes, it can cause a problem with uploading it before your uh, browser times out. So just keep that in mind. But um, if you just have a few extra data columns, it'll be totally fine. Then what was another example? Are you, are you going to um, suggest a way, or would you, could you suggest a way, how would you get like the time down to milliseconds? I mean, obviously, if you've got five rows, that's possible to do manually. If you've got thousands of records. So, so in, this, in the R. In the R code, um, there's script for doing that, or I can send you like two two rows, two little rows that will do it for you. And then if you're like working with Excel, no, not that nobody works with Excel, but if somebody you knew was don't working with Excel, you it. can you can tell it you want three. You have to go to like custom. If anybody asks you, the, the problem with Excel is what it shows you is not what it has. So what you tell it to do is how you want to see the data. But you export the data in the text file, will still not write what you. No, want if you do it as a custom, you have to like. You can you force have to, it, but you have it's to really hard. It needs a lot of convince. I would, if <laughs> if I were to ever use Excel, I always just like read in. Every, I made it make it read. Every, I don't let it interpret anything. I make it read every single value as text, and then it won't mess it up. So, you, right. If but you it's want. It's not the time. So if you treat it as a text you, string, you can do what you want. Yeah. Um, and Jenny, if you write it in like MATLAB or any other program, this would just control the format of that. Treat it as a text string and control the format with a, you know, a space, a dash, and then the values dot. And yeah. Um, also, while we're talking about the timestamp thing, one other thing I wanted to add for those of you who haven't put data in MoveBank yet, when you put data in MoveBank, it will deal with whatever when it's the tracking data, it will deal with the whole time step issue and you don't need to pre-process your data to deal with that. So here's what it looks like when you're importing, uh, like if you just have a CSV file with your data in it, you can tell MoveBank, I have one column that has a month, a year, I have a different column with hour, minute, second, here's the time zone offset I used. Um, you can just have hours, minutes, you can have no times at all, and then MoveBank will just convert it to the right format, and it'll just use zeros for any information you don't give it. So, so that is a little bit different than your available points. You're responsible for getting it into that timestamp format, but for your tracking data and movement, it will help you with that. Um, the other, so what are the other little? What's this one? I'm not using slides. Um, Okay, so this is what I have instead of slides. Um, we've kind of covered all this, but yeah, so as far as, and you brought up perfectly, I wanted to talk about what kinds of, this, this is just to have a, a CSV file with times and locations that you want to annotate. And so there's lots of different ways, the reasons people might want to do this. So there's like available points, like we did and we have for the exercises in this workshop. Um, you might have a study site and you want to know what the weather was over time so you can see how they're, you know, how the weather at a time might trigger some behavior or migration. Um, you might have simulated tracks. Moving doesn't care. So, um, so you can think about what, does anybody else have ideas of what kinds of 
available locations. You can take the observed locations that you have and use a time function manipulation to add a day, to add a month, to add an hour, duplicate the same pattern every, you know, on the 15th of every month, or check what it was the year before, the year after, all kinds of this kind of time manipulation. You can shift it all one kilometer to the left, 10 kilometers to the right, 20 kilometers north, yeah, so yeah, so the point you can do all kinds of stuff. It's pretty much infinite movement is just going to treat it all the same way and annotate it. So yeah, get creative, but then also keep in mind what's your question, what's the resolution of the data sets available and your data. And then as far as the the using like if you don't need time and you want to just but you need to provide a timestamp, so you need some kind of filler. A couple comments on that. Um, one is if it's really meaningless, I I would recommend make a time, like put in 18, like January 1st, 1800, or put something in so you won't accidentally interpret it as something meaningful later or somebody else, if you pass down the file to somebody else. So put it in like a crazy time that doesn't mean anything to you. Um, the other thing would be, like you could think maybe like the middle of, if your data cover a month, put it in the middle of the month. Like maybe there would be something you might want to annotate with it. Uh, but just, th that would be another idea. And then I was going to show a file that Gil and I made of availability points where, where is it, this one? Yeah, so here we calculated the availability points and then we looked at the time range of the tracking data we had and we took a timestamp for every two weeks, I think, and then we just did each of the available points at each of those times. And that was relatively easy to build that file. Yeah, so we use the NDVI 16-day mosaic, so there's no reason to ask for it every day. It doesn't change for 16 days. So you're basically interpolating between two points as many arbitrary times as you stick there. So it's just pseudo, it's pseudo replication. It's inflating the size of the data set without giving you any more information. So we basically use midnight of every two weeks at each point. But so we had to know ahead of time what it was we wanted to annotate before we prepared this. If we were look, if we wanted to look at weather and changes, if we wanted to look at nighttime and daytime, then our time of day would have mattered. Um, but we're looking at a data set that, that's bi-weekly, so we didn't need that. So that's why it's nice to go browse, see what you want to annotate, and then maybe think about that might impact what kind of availability records you want to submit. Um. Same goes for spatial resolution. If you use a the 100 kilometer data, there's no reason to ask for every meter. That's not going to give you a lot of information. So kind of ballpark, if you had half of the spatial resolution of the data, it's not going to give you anything that you need to know more than, than you have there. Even half doesn't really add information, makes it more convenient to plot. But so look at the resolution of the data when you make, if you really make up data, don't make it super detail in frequency, but if you have a track and whatever that track is and you want to just replicate it in time, go for it. So forget about the spatial resolution. You'll get a lot of, uh, you'll get a lot of pseudo replication and autocorrelation in space, but you'll get the same autocorrelation structure in your actual data, so you might as well keep it. So this was all I had that I wanted to be sure to cover. So we can do more questions. I can walk through more stuff on the site. Um, or you guys can go ahead and try sub doing some submissions, because we might be able to get the results back by tomorrow to look at tomorrow. So um, I guess let's do questions. Anything else that people would like me to cover here? So when you're doing this request for other types of like environmental data, is it only point data you can get, or is there an option to do yeah, so that's what we're going to look at tomorrow. So I mean, I can I can give you like a preview. The one we didn't talk about. Yet. Yeah, so that's that third option is over a gridded. Um, where are we? So what we have right now is you can do it over a, a gridded bounding box. So it's it's got to be a rectangle, but yes, you can do that. And so what we'll do tomorrow is we'll go through how you define that bounding box, and then a little bit about how. There's different, so you can get this in uh, your output. You can request as a PNG, so that's just 
an image, um, PNG, KMZ, so that's a Google Earth file, so it's a georeferenced image that then you can just plot on Google Earth, um, or a geotiff, and so that's like a raster with, all, with the actual values in band one, and you can plot those in R, you can plot those in uh, GIS program. Um, yeah, so, but we'll talk more about it tomorrow. GeoTIFF is not scaled like to gray from 0 to 254 or something? So the GeoTIFFs actually contain the annotated values, I believe, and then you can, but it, like if you plot it in, um, in R, it just like makes the legend for you and, and reads it. And then you can download here these uh, RGB mappings. Those you can use as like legend, um, whether you're using like QGIS or ArcGIS, have different names for them. But um, it's the data you need to like create a legend out of out of your output, um, and you can download those. Yeah, and then there's different how you there's different color schemes that you can roughly equate to the type of stuff you're annotating. And I don't, we don't have a perfect color scheme for every single one. And so now that this is more open than it was before, I'm definitely up for like requests or if you guys notice things that you know I want to annotate this, but I can't like none of these color schemes seems relevant. Um, let me know because that's stuff we can um, add to. What will wind look like here? So for wind, you'll put it in trivial, and then how you interpret it to meters per second there. Yeah, so that's what I want to look at. Like wind, there's stuff in here that, there, I mean, it should have, there should be something here that says wind, because that's, whether that's trivial or when. So we have to, I have to look at the color mappings to see what makes sense. But if you get the GeoTIFF files, so if you choose GeoTIFF, then it's like not even relevant. It's just the values, and then you can kind of build whatever you want in R or in your JS program. Basically, always use GeoTIFF. <laughs> that was the one I could figure out how to get to use the best once I started playing with them. Yeah, so I guess that's my recommendation. I mean, well, this one's nice because you can like get the result and like just click a button and it opens Google Earth and plots it. So um, what I recommend for any of these also is with the available points and with this like do a, get a little snippet of data and just like run it through and make sure it works and make sure you get everything looks like what you want. Um, and before you do like tons of requests or like build really fancy um, inputs, like go ahead and like do one, make sure it plots where you want it to um, and then you it'll get easier and then you can, it'll be easier to just go and do what you need to do from there. Any other questions? It looks like everyone's sort of digging in, diving in, right? OK. So um, we'll just, I think, let you guys keep doing that. And if you have questions or problems, uh, let us know. Right? OK. Uh, oh, wait, question. You want to just for her or yeah. for everybody? You don't want to share I mean, your question? Everyone can listen if they want, but it's probably not relevant. <laughs> so, okay. In what program are you opening it? In Excel. Yeah, so don't download it. Don't download a CSV <laughs> and open it in Excel. That's now, why she didn't I, want to say the question out I, loud. She knew Gil was going to ask Yeah, so no, but this is a common question. I think I may have already answered it earlier. Yeah, so um, it, Excel doesn't read that time format, so it messes it up. And then if you open it in Excel, you can get around it by going, like selecting the column and go to format cells and do custom and then repeat the cell the format and then it will show them to you um or what you do is like read in the like go open excel and then say import csv file and force it to import that column as text and not try and do anything with it then you can maintain it won't mess it up or you can download it, the excel file and then it will That's what I usually do, yeah. 
or in or like import it to R and explore it in R. Like just read the CSV straight into R. That's what I do most of the time. Also with Excel, it will your output from the annotations are they they have like fifteen. Uh, Di significant digits, and so if you open them Excel, it will truncate them, which is like you don't need all those. You should really truncate most of the significant digits, anyways, because they're not actually significant. But we just give them to you. But um, just so you know, it will change the values a little bit because it'll like crop off some of the numbers. <laughs> 